The prophetic requirements which we need as your church to be honest, to be true to the call you've given to us, that your church might rise up in ways which pleases you and serves our world. Bless Roy as he comes, give him anointing, give him clarity, give him inspiration, give him a challenge which will be presented to him and to us, that we may leave here as people charged with the mandate of the kingdom of heaven, in Jesus' name. Amen. Roy. I've been asked before I start on today's uh, lecture to just recap the main points of yesterday's lecture, which has caught me uh, on the hop because I've got my notes with me, uh, such as they were. But really, yesterday I was trying to say that our culture is on the move, it is fast changing, and that causes a dislocation between the generations who have different experiences of the world, and that we are dealing with five tensions at the moment, and many of the debates that we are having, from the debate uh, about Europe to the debate on homosexuality, how are in, in, they are affected by these f uh, five tensions. The tensions were the tension between the modern world and the postmodern world, the as yet unnamed new world that we are moving towards, but we cannot yet characterize the world in which many of our young people are already living in and trying to understand. Modern world characterized by confidence, a sense of having arrived, the sense of being able to beat the problems uh, and to be in control. The postmodern world can uh, consists of despair, lack of confidence, a feeling that science has let us down, that religion is no longer true in any universal sense. Secondly, the um, movement, the tension between the global and the local, that as we get connected by media, by markets, by tourism, by trade, so the world becomes an interconnected and interdependent whole in which cultures no longer retain their boundaries around their identity, but all become mixed in some way. And how that leads to resurgence of the emphasis of the local, as people go back to old uh, traditional tribal definitions and fight for their old identities, such as in Rwanda and Bosnia and in the devolution debate here in Wales and Scotland as well. Old localities breaking out rather than aggregate nations. The demise of the nation state as multinationals become more powerful than governments. Thirdly, the tension between tradition and choice. Tradition has become just another choice. Things which previous generations took as a given, such as the fact that you would marry and not live with a partner, or that you could, did not have to choose what sexual orientation you were because that was not an option now have become choices themselves. And that in this world in which we have no given criteria because we do not believe in God as to what is a good and a bad choice, too many choices lead not to freedom but to anxiety. And we are a society characterized by anxiety. Fourth, if my memory serves me well, was the tension between truth and power, where there is no such thing in, in the new world as the truth but only my truth and your truth. And for you to claim that your truth is also my truth is one of the most offensive things in our pluralistic society. And this makes Christian mission very difficult because we believe that Jesus is the truth about God. And it will make Christian witness, if it continues, more and more difficult as people accuse Christians of being immoral in a, word where, in a world where tolerance is the highest form of morality. It's going to be a strange world if it continues like that. And fifthly, I didn't have too much time, but fifthly, consumption and meaning. Meaning was, in the modern world, attached to words. So we believed that proclamation was the most important thing, but in the postmodern world, meaning is also attached to things and the accumulation of things in our lives is also the accumulation 
of the symbols and the badges and the messages that those things denote, from Levi jeans to the kind of car you have to the kind of lifestyle you have. These are the things that radiate your ideology, your vision, your lifestyle, not necessarily the words you speak. And in that kind of world, Christians are called to serve and to speak. And I talked at the end about the need for Christians to come with non-manipulative love to the world because it is a world that is suspicious of truth as power, power over people, that when we claim truth for others, we are seeking to colonize them, to have power over them. And therefore, Christianity is called back to the theology of the cross to show that the history of the church is not the history of religious wars only, but the history of martyrdom and of service as well. Is that good enough as a kind of... Uh, I have most appalling memory, and it's probably the wrong talk I've just summarized. <laughs> OK, so my watch is starting now, OK? So, you know, if you've... You know, that was free. That was for free. Uh, and now, now I've got this new thing called Sportline. It's anything in my life that's really sporty. And I press this button and um, it starts counting. It's wonderful. The trouble is sometimes I press the wrong button and it counts down. So at the end I've actually talked for minus one hour rather than for... Okay, let's get going. State of the church. For those who didn't think I had any notes yesterday, okay, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, so religious faith is the conviction of things not seen. And I want to say several things about this for a start because in the Christian faith we are tempted most to build institutions out of faith. And as soon as we do that, we are tempted away from religious faith as the conviction of things not seen. To maintain and sustain and tinker with the institutions that we have made. So the one of the most distressing things I find today in the evangelical movement is people talking about the church rather than talking about God. So point number one about this is invisibility. I'm very keen on invisibility. Because religious faith has got at its premise the idea that God is invisible and that the gift of a good God to the world is the freedom of God's creation. If God was visible, we could not be free. Because as many of the Old Testament prophets, Moses, Isaiah and others found out, we cannot bear the holiness of God. So it is in the goodness of God's mercy that God is invisible to us and the invisibility of God, which means that we have to believe in God by faith, is a sign that one of the most basic things to the whole of creation that runs through creation like lettering through a stick of rock is the idea of freedom. God's retreat in terms of invisibility, though his presence is always with us, is a sign that he wants us to be free. Secondly, coherence, things which make sense. So God is not coercive. People who say, I wish that God would write it in the sky could not be more wrong. God does not do anything to coerce, to force his creation to believe in him. What God wanted was for people freely to choose to worship him. We are not puppets. God does not force us to worship he constantly interacts with the world. He sustains every part of it. But it is this coherence that is throughout the whole of creation, the fact that it is understandable, that makes scientific investigation possible. One of the things about the postmodern world is science is becoming more taken up with chaos. And one of the reasons for that is that as science loses its roots, in a Christian understanding of the world and the coherence of the world that the Creator has given it, it be begins to not understand the world. It's a coherent world. We call this world nature, but there's nothing natural about it. 
And science has not succeeded in disproving Christianity, much as many have attempted it. In the United States, over 39% of scientists say they believe in a personal God. In 1916, that figure was 41.8%, not a major shift over the most intense period of scientific investigation in that figure. Invisibility, coherence, thirdly, ambivalence. God also acts in the world so that every action is capable of other explanations. But each action is an invitation to faith. It's to do with freedom again. God is concerned that we respond to him and his works because we believe in him. But in every action that God does, there is the possibility of walking away from it with another explanation. Even when Jesus did miracles, they were not coercive. There were those who did not believe. Jesus says about the generations such as ours, blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. We walk by faith, not by sight. Fourthly, resurrection. This faith that we have in an invisible God who sustains the whole world and who acts in it all the time, but whose actions can be given all kinds of alternative explanations because he desires us to be free, is not just my subjective opinion, but is predicated on a response to one event in human history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is an activity of God in history, the greatest event of all human history, on which human history revolves, which itself is capable of all kinds of other explanations, misinterpretations, and distortions. But it is a unique event on which Christianity depends for its very life and its future. 50% of people in Britain say they believe in the resurrection, but do they understand the implications of the resurrection? Paul states its importance very boldly when he says, no resurrection, no Christianity. Over the last 2,000 years, Christians have lived and died in the name of Jesus Christ, and religion has been a mixed bag. Our generation has come to see it as a mixed bag. Many of my friends who are not Christians would not come to church because they believe it to be unjust. In particular amongst my age group, and I know this is probably difficult for some of you to hear, but the treatment of women uh, in the church has been a major stumbling block for many of my friends. And they would not darken the doors of a church because they see it as perpetrating injustice hard for us to understand these things, hard for us to take them on board, but there are many things that say religion is a mixed bag. Yet, the one thing that we have to deal with, and everybody has to deal with, is the persistence of religion in a world which is increasingly fed up with the sterility of the mechanistic and the materialistic. One of the reasons for the wave of new ageism is because people cannot live by secularization alone. They cannot live by the purely material and the mechanistic. People are hungry and searching for meaning and for spirituality. Next, response. Faith is a response to the evidence of God's presence. I find it very difficult to believe that people can look at the world of creation and think that behind this world is chance or coincidence or even a pair of furry dice in the back of a cosmic cortina driven by Terry Pratchett. It's not just an individual response, but it's also the foundation of a new community historically and geographically. When people say to me, as they do in a pluralistic society, what right have you to say that about God? I say, I'm sorry, but these are not my views. These are the views of a whole tradition of 2,000 years of people living by them and a cross-cultural tradition 
from which every, people from every tribe and nation come. I stand in the middle of a tradition. These are not views I made up. These are views I came into. I am not on my own. I am part of a cosmic community which stretches back in history and across geographically. Remember it, it's a great response that passes when you get onto these hot subjects. Maybe it's just me that goes to parties and gets onto these hot subjects. You all seem to look as if you've never been uh, into one of these. Maybe I'll have to take you to some of my parties. They're very tame, actually. I'm part of an ongoing story which gives my life purpose and meaning. In an essay entitled Where Religion Meets Politics, Professor of Politics at Hull University, B.K. Perek, says this. When the main concern is to get on in life, to pursue pleasure and to promote self-interest, there is a tendency to cut moral corners and bend moral principle to the requirements of personal convenience. Religion stresses the quality of the human soul and forces people to examine what kind of human beings they have become. I think that's true. That in a world where convenience is one of the dominant moralities of our day or amoralities of our day and things are bent to convenience what religion does is it forces us to examine honestly the human condition and that doesn't mean that we accept anything which calls itself religious our world is religiously plural not really secular we need wisdom and discernment about what is good and what is bad. He continues in this article, although religion has been a force for evil, it has also been a force for good, generating a kind of energy, commitment, passion and willingness to suffer that was sometimes lacking in holy secular motivations. Bhikkhu Parekh, as far as I know, is not a Christian. But that kind of comment is becoming more prevalent today. People are beginning to see that religion is important. There is a kind of sacrifice, a commitment, a passion for justice, a concern with truth that people have who are religious that the secular world often does not have. The church often gets stereotyped by the world. and It's one of the things we would always have to put up with. We are, as I said yesterday, a mixed bag, the wheat and the tares growing together. How are we faring in terms of the changes and the growth of the church movement? Well, in Britain, 12% of the population go to church once a week or more, as compared to 19% in other countries, 40% in the US. So in terms of church attendance, we're quite low. 8% attend church on a monthly basis, and 13% of people regard themselves as core members. 11% of people read the Bible every day, and as many as 44% pray daily. If I could give you another lecture, I would talk about the importance of prayer to evangelism. It is seen often as coercive today to knock on a door and evangelize somebody. It is not seen as coercive to offer to pray with somebody. And the prevalence of prayer in our society, often in crisis situations, the willingness of local congregations to say that they are praying for the needs of the community, to have a box where people can anonymously put their needs in, is still seen as a supportive thing in our society. And it's one of the things we need to think creatively about in our mission strategy. You know, something for free. In the world, there are 1.9 billion Christians. 34% of the world are Christians. 54% of these are Roman Catholics. The church grows by 100,000 every day, one third of whom are children. The church is growing faster than world population. 1.8 to 1.6% per annum, respectively. I know statistics get boring after a while after the first one actually, but uh, just bear with me for, it's only two more paragraphs of these things. It just means you've got to get the tape really. While the church grows worldwide, 
and new churches are being added, one of the most important things to understand about our culture is that there is more believing than belonging in our culture. So 61% of the British population say they believe in God. We are not a secular society. 50% say they believe in heaven, 37% in miracles, 25% in angels, 24% in hell and the devil. 37% believe that God is concerned personally with individuals. 68% of the British people consider themselves Christians. 71% of these believe in the resurrection. These are high figures. Grace Davey, a sociologist who's written very, very effectively on Christianity in Britain, says this about the phenomenon of believing without belonging. Religious belief, when not associated with active membership of a church, tends to be associated with superstitious belief, while church attendance tends to be antithetical, that is, against superstition. Moreover, we have some evidence that for those people who do not go to church, yet say they're religious and pray often, religious belief has moved quite far from the orthodox church position and is really much closer to what would normally be called superstition. In other words, church membership seems to be vital for giving content to one's faith, for making it coherent and understandable. And although 61% of the British population believe in God, it may be when they say that, it is God that we do not understand by that word a God of fate, a God they pray to when they cross the road to buy their lottery ticket, a God they pray to when they're in the exam room and have not done the revision. I have prayed to that God so many times. He does not hear any prayers. So yes, we seem to be a religious society Where are all these people who believe these things? But because they are not getting the kind of teaching that you are blessed with here at Keswick, the distortions accumulate. And what is religious belief becomes superstitious belief. Believing and belonging are are part of the same Christian faith. It is not a faith that is based on individualism, on the isolation of the individual. It is a faith that says we cannot walk alone. We need each other. It is as the community of Jesus Christ that we walk forward. After all, words like love and justice require at least two people. If you are to talk about love, you must have someone who is loving and somebody to be loved. Love is not a word that can be demonstrated in an individualistic way. Christianity is a faith of the community as much as a faith of the individual. Indeed, the word individual is a non-Christian word. Individual is a word in my childhood which was more rightly applied to fruit pies. Do you remember individual fruit pies? (laughs) It's wonderful talking to an older congregation sometimes. Say this to young people, they don't remember individual fruit pies. They were the ones with all the promise, but the big hole underneath the pastry. Do you remember that? (laughs) And the kind of bit of kind of stuff that looked red and horrible at the bottom, which was it could have been blackberries, it could have been raspberries, it could have been anything. Okay, let's keep individual for fruit pies. The basic building block of our creation is of the person in community. The one thing that was not good before the fall. The only thing that was not good before the introduction of evil into the world was man alone. God said it is not good for man to be alone. Why? Because this individualized person, not yet sexually differentiated, the Hebrew, uh, let's know that, could not reflect the God who is Trinity. God is person in community. And made in the image of God, we are person in community. And being in community is essential to being human, which is why the fact that one in three of the population in the next 20 years will live on their own, statistically with a cat, 
is a tragedy for our society. And why those of us who are involved in social action and social justice do so on strong theological grounds. Because we believe in a Trinitarian God who is person in community. So believing and belonging are part of the same faith. Because God wanted a community who would freely and voluntarily worship him. And at the end of time, this cross-cultural community is described before the throne of grace as being from every tribe and nation. So Christianity is not just about some individual search for inner meaning, but it's focused in two places. Firstly, the inward journey is not focused on the self as it is in our therapeutic community but on God. Contemplation and meditation, things which are dear to my own heart, are not introversion and introspection, but meditation on the person of a holy God. Self-identity, about which so many books have been written and so many courses offered at such high a price, is a gift to the person who is willing to make the worship of God and obedience to God the stuff of their inner life. So the inward journey focused on God, but the new outwardness is not based on self-interest, as in capitalism, or how the world can serve me and turn out for my good, but on others and the needs of others. The Christian has given the motivation for this outward journey in mission and service and in a passion for justice because of his or her discovery that life is a gift in which we realize that we are loved by God as we are now. And our response and our responsibility is to demonstrate this to others. And so Christian spirituality and Christian social justice are both based on a response and an expression of the love of God to us as we are now. Many Christians today are at the coal face of social action, demonstrating that the Christians worship a God of justice. And that Christians must come to terms with the fact that in worship we become what we worship. And if we believe we worship a God of justice, we must become the people of justice because the revelation of God becomes the requirements of his people because we are in a covenant relationship with God. If Israel was a light to the Gentiles and the church is a light to the nations, part of the light of God is that the holiness of God is exemplified in his righteousness and his justice. How can Christians in a fallen and unjust world not be concerned about issues of justice. Here is Yasmin Alibai, a Muslim writer, talking about Christianity. For the first time, she says, I can think about Christianity in its original form, the Good Samaritan faith. With the end of the British Empire and the declining power of the church in Britain, Christianity is far less attached to politics in a traditional sense. Take the reaction of the churches to the new asylum law. The churches have done more than anyone else to fight these iniquitous laws. The Jewish community and some black groups have opposed these laws, but many ethnic minority groups have done nothing. Across Europe, most so-called radicals have failed to confront attempts to reduce asylum rights in the way that Christian groups have. I'm incredibly impressed by that. Here is a person who is a Muslim impressed by the passion for justice that Christian groups have had on behalf of others who are falling foul of what they see to be unjust laws in Britain on asylum. One instance of how Christian social action can do things to move people that sometimes words follow behind 
rather in front of. Some of you might have heard of the think tank Demos, one of the most uh, innovative and powerful think tanks uh, in our country. And in an article in its journal on religion, uh, because the recent uh, uh, edition was on religion, it's worth getting, Ben Jupp, who is senior researcher at that think tank, says this. Much of the best innovation in the provision of local health, homelessness, community regeneration, and drug-related services is now being shaped by people with strong religious beliefs. Projects such as the Marylebone Health Centre, the Kaleidoscope Drugs Project in Kingston, Surrey, and the Bromley by Bow Community Centre in East London have been pioneers in taking account of the full range of human needs when providing care. This resurgence of religious engagement with the wider community has coincided with withdrawal of the state from direct provision of many services. Ben Jupp, as far as I know, is not a Christian. He's writing as a secular commentator. When I opened that edition of that magazine, I thought, what are they going to say about Christianity? And I kind of had my heart in my mouth, and I was absolutely amazed at the way they so positively portrayed the engagement of Christianity with the modern world. In Christianity, then, the quest for social justice is the other side of and the inevitable companion of the quest for true spirituality, because the God we worship is a God of justice as well as love. And God wants a world that is more just rather than less just. At the age of 14, I came downstairs in the middle of the night and I was under a lot of pressure. And I thought I was losing my faith. And I was in despair. And I picked up a book of my sister's, who's five years older than me, called Strength to Love by Martin Luther King. And I read it. And it changed my life. Because he was a person who wasn't just concerned with his own personal insurance policy for eternity. Not concerned just about the ghetto and staying in the comfort zone of the Christian church. But a man who thought the Christian faith was worth risking your life for. A man who knew that the God he worshipped was a God of justice. And that wherever he came against injustice, he had to go on the line, take a risk to be against injustice. One of the ways we focus on this set of tensions between the inner and the outer life is to look at the kingdom of God. One of the central motifs of the New Testament and, in fact, the Old Testament. The reign of God. What kind of world does the reign of God consist of? The reign of God means that there is another way of living. Another way of living in this world. We don't have to live for money or power. We don't have to build empires. We can live in this world as if there's a gen another agenda. As the book of Acts tells us, these worship another king, one Jesus. And this kingdom is currently invisible, as is its king. The life of this kingdom can only be lived by faith. But the teaching of Jesus left his followers in no doubt about how a life lived like this was to be lived. The parables, the miracles, the life of Christ were evidence of the presence of the kingdom among us and a guide to it. Graham Cray, principal of Ridley College, Cambridge, says these things about the kingdom. The sick are given back the possibility of an active role in society. The demonized are set free and restored to normal relationships. Cleansed lepers can come back into the community. Those experiencing untimely bereavement have their loved ones and breadwinners restored. Jesus' table fellowship of tax collectors and sinners was the foretaste of their place in the messianic banquet of the last day. His acceptance of women and little children gave them a special or best part in the kingdom, both present and future. 
to live in this way, to see our job as restoring people to community through the work of Christ is a difficult road to go on. No promise, as we heard this week, of the avoidance of suffering, tragedy and failure and high standards to live up to. Only in the next world will we live in a world where by nature we please God. We live now in a world of disease and evil and suffering and we have to do something about it. The kingdom of God is not the church. It's one of the great heresies of history to equate the life of the church with the life of the kingdom. And only God can bring in the kingdom. We cannot build it out of building blocks, whether they build building blocks of doctrine or of politics. It is God's gift. But we are a signpost to the presence of the kingdom. Our life is meant to exemplify the life of the kingdom. The problem is that there are two ways to see the church. The first is a decaying institution with its failures and inconsistencies. The second, the beginning of a new community, a new way of being human, which everybody is invited to experience. Now in this life, we will always only dimly reflect the new community. I don't think there's any progressive message in the Church of Jesus Christ. In every age, the wheat and the tares still grow. In every age, we have our failures and our weaknesses as well as our successes. And it is God's invisible work weaving the tapestry of human history which is going on, which we can only see dimly in our own lives. But one day, as Charles has said, we will see the whole thing and see what God has done in our lives. I like the picture of the church uh, which... Uh, was uh, given to us by that well-known uh, expositor, Doctor Who. Uh, I don't know if you remember Doctor Who. Do you remember Doctor Who? I was obsessed with Doctor Who as a child. I won't admit to being obsessed with Doctor Who now. Um, but for those of you who are not initiated into the great faith of Doctor Who, um, Doctor Who travelled through time in a battered old police box. A police box uh, was a telephone box, a blue one with a kind of blue light on the top. It was a battered old police box called the TARDIS. From the outside, it looked battered and weathered and no good for anything. It also looked very small. You could probably just fit one person inside it. But when you opened the door and went inside, you found a strange thing. It was bigger on the inside than it was on the outside. Do you remember that? I always wanted to go inside the TARDIS. In fact, Doctor Who once said in a well-known hermeneutical comment on the universe that nobody had ever explored the limits of the TARDIS. It was eternity in a police box. The church is similar to the TARDIS. From the outside, it looks battered, decaying, the paint is falling off, and statistics tell us it's very small. But walk inside the church and see it from the inside, and the strange thing you will find is it's bigger on the inside than it is from the outside. Because all of eternity is there to explore. Perhaps the biggest difference is that the church doesn't move through time quite as easily. <laughs> At the same time, we are frustrated with the church. All of us here have things in the church which make us grind our teeth. Frustrated with it. It is essential to be frustrated with the church. A friend of mine, George Verwer, some of you might know him and known him for many, many years. I heard him speak recently at EA, I think it was, or Tear Fund, somewhere like that. And he said, I'm a frustrated fighter. Do 
just feeling that they just never get there. And this sense of restlessness and frustration is essential to the Christian life because we do not live in the world of contentment. We do not live in a world in which we can just settle down. We are fighters. So at the same time, we're aware that we're ordinary, human, frail, frustrated and restless. But also we know that God is at work in us, changing us, loving us, and bringing us on as the church of Jesus Christ. And that in this very same church that we are frustrated with, we find the deepest love and fellowship, grace and mercy. These two things together are an essential perspective on the Christian church. So we mustn't veer towards romanticism as if we are already reigning in heaven with Christ and everything's okay, we just sing our songs, forget the world. And we mustn't become pessimistic and despairing about the church because God is committed to the church. Christ has died for the church. As John Stott says, we must not be naive optimists or dark pessimists, but biblical realists. And it's important that this church is a cross-cultural community. The church is not a club where we can relax with like-minded people. So many local churches have settled down with one another, implicitly giving up on mission because they prefer the comfort of the routine of the church. How will that change the world? In Luke 6, 32 to 36, Jesus says to us, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great. The love of God is not exemplified in reciprocity. My kids come and play with your kids, and your kids come and play with my kids. You come to supper with me, and I go to supper with you, and we like each other, and we love each other, and it's a wonderful thing, but Jesus says even sinners do that. If the profile of the love of God is to be seen in the life of the church, we have to love those we do not like. Love those we do not get on with. Love those who hate us. Which means that you and I have got to cross the congregation to speak to the person we've not spoken on, spoken to for years because they have a different view of what Calvin said to us. And we have to make friends who are not Christians. And not just friends because we've got a mission coming up who we drop the week after the mission is over. How God must hate that. But friends with whom we have mutual vulnerability, to whom we are committed for life, and can see in us the life of Christ, but also the struggle Mission is not a public relations exercise for the kingdom of God. All too often, the church's portrayal of its own life is sweetness, light, and sentiment. We also have to admit with shame to things that go on in our life which are deeply shaming to us, of failures, of inconsistencies, of injustices because we're committed to a God of truth. We will not convince a world by hiding our vulnerabilities in the name of sentiment. 
we are called to be honest with one another, with the world, about where we have come to in our Christian pilgrimage. And as far as I'm concerned, the world is fed up with a church that speaks of a Christian faith which sounds too good to be true. We've heard it from Charles Price this week. The plans of God are good for God, but often not good for us. And we go through great failure and suffering in our lives, and we've got to own it as Jeremiah did. Because otherwise we cannot say we are committed to the truth. And yet, in the church, there is this wonder of unity in diversity. Because how are we to have a diverse congregation unless we go with the love of God to people who are unlike us? Unless, with our heart in our mouth, we take a risk because a risk is the obverse side of a step of faith. A risk to be rejected, to be laughed at, to be turned down. It is by taking that risk and going to people unlike us that we cross boundaries erected by our culture to make the church diverse. If we don't do that, it will just be a club of like-minded people. Even sinners can do that. People get on at the golf club. Why shouldn't they get on in a church of like-minded people? The miracle is that people that the world thinks are enemies call each other brother and sister. That is the love of God. Melanie Howard uh, writes, person who I don't know uh, her, her standing or who she is, but she just writes this somewhere. She joined her local church in Hackney, not because she was a believer, but because she wanted her daughter to go to the church school. A motive which she admits was cynical, but which I've heard from many other people. She's just the one who's honest about it. She is still there. Now, years into this relationship, she says, the enduring motive for my regular pilgrimage is that church is the only place in the neighbourhood where it's possible to meet a local community of people from a wide range of backgrounds. The congregation includes Afro-Caribbeans, Nigerians, middle-class professionals, working-class families, the unemployed, single parents, older residents and young people. The facilities are used throughout the week by a girls' youth club, a pensioners' lunch club, brownies and guides, women's groups for spiritual development meetings and as a night shelter for the homeless during the winter. It is a real centre for local activities and groups of all kind. A diverse community. Our world is turning away from individualism and isolation, longing for community. And what we need to say is, you want the community? Here is the community. Here is that diverse community that you long to belong to. Here is this unified group of former enemies. Why is there a welcome here for you? Because of the love of God that accepts us as we are. So the outworking of the Christian faith is not just a thing of private virtue, but entails becoming a diverse community, that city on a hill, and becoming engaged as salt and light in public life. But Christianity enters public life to fulfil its own agenda of being the signpost to the kingdom of God. The church is not interested in political life, in order to promote a party, or become a party, or an ideology. But it's because it's concern for people and their welfare. Those of us who are involved in the political life of the nation do so because of the gospel, not because we are building political empires. The Bible is concerned not just about the eternal destiny of people's souls, but the Creator God is passionately committed to justice and for health and shalom for the people, whole bodies and lives living now. One of the problems we face, though, as the church, 
is as we go out with the great message of salvation to proclaim and to demonstrate it according to our various gifts and callings. We know that we live in a world where the church is divided. So many evangelists have said to me they go out, as it were, on a tree limb into the world to proclaim the gospel. And as they look back, they find that somebody's sawing the branch off. Because they want to say, look at the church. And people look at the church and they not, are not encouraged by us. As Grace Savior Davy says, people may believe, but they do not want to belong. How do we approach this? The US has got 1,600 different church groupings. Should we be embarrassed by this? Should we shrug our shoulders? But church is not only split into the Protestant, Catholic and Orthodox wings, but into different subcultures. The evangelical church is split into five subcultures. The conservative, the contemplative, the charismatic, the radical, and the post-evangelical. These, for me, it's just my personal opinion, are the five subcultures of the contemporary evangelical movement. Each of these has its different emphases. The conservative, and many of you here would call yourself, as I do, a conservative evangelical, emphasizes the message of the kingdom. The contemplative evangelical emphasizes the spirituality of the kingdom. The charismatic emphasizes the dynamics of the kingdom. The radical emphasizes the values of the kingdom. The post-evangelical emphasizes the diversity of the kingdom. Now, it's no sin to belong to one of these groups. No sin to draw our understanding of what being a Christian entails from its perceptions. And yet, a sign of maturity in any movement, whether it is Christian or not, is an ability to develop a self-critical perspective, an ability to laugh at oneself, to see one's own weaknesses, and compromises. The evangelical movement is a movement which is very recent in church history. And it has as its greatest strength and its greatest weakness a borrowing from the Enlightenment tradition of the modern world. The evangelical world, the evangelical worldview, is completely entwined with modernity. And one reasons why evangelicals are struggling in a postmodern world is that mission will always be difficult for us until we become self-critical about the compromises we have made. One of the greatest compromises which are, we are, have been trying to rectify for the last 25 years has been an excessive impact on individualism, on salvation only for the private and the personal life of the individual, and a neglect of the great swathes of scripture that show that God is winning an entire community for himself and seeks to reach and reconcile the whole world to himself. But that has got incredible consequences for those of us who are into environment and politics and economics, not just those of us who are into religion. I am an open evangelical. That means that I have got a willingness to learn from other traditions. Recently, I went through a time of darkness in my own spiritual life. Indeed, I'm only just coming out of it. And what helped me in that time was a new appreciation of the writings of Catholic writers, like Henri Noun, Richard Raw and Ronald Rawheiser. They spoke to me in the darkness 
in a way that I was not used to being spoken to. And I had to repent of my stereotyping of Catholic spirituality. And that was painful. You see, one of the things we have to admit to is sometimes that we define the word Christian so closely that we become discouraged by God's work in the world. When I said to some of you there are 1.9 billion Christians in the world, some of you would have thought, ah, but what kind of Christians are they? Could they sign the basis of faith? We must learn to be committed to truth, to biblical revelation, but also to be open to others from other traditions who own the name of Jesus Christ. And to learn from their life and not to see ourselves as self-sufficient within the evangelical church. It is to realize that we, who are conservative evangelicals, have excesses, not just charismatic evangelicals. To realize that contemplative people are spending sometimes more time with God on their knees in prayer than we, in our over-activism, will ever do. To realize those involved in radical social issues have not given up on the gospel, but are trying to implement its concerns in an unjust world. And to see that those young people who say that they are post-evangelical do not need bitter judgment and the label of traitor, but need to be understood as those who are trying to receive from other traditions, as well as the very fine biblical tradition of our own evangelical movement. In, in one word, we need generosity to one another. I have sat through meetings in evangelical parachurch organisations which have made me physically sick at the way in which fe fellow evangelicals have treated one another. The gospel is not just contained in the words of the gospel itself, but in the ways we live the gospel with each other. How can the world say, see how they love one another, if we do not actually love one another? Time has gone, and I must close. I'm halfway through my lecture. <laughs> Story of my life. Two things. If we are to live this kind of life, we realise it's not going to be the life of super-Christian. It's going to be our own, maybe inadequate offering, the, lo the life of loaves and fishes. So that's certainly the story of my life. Then we must concentrate not on our inadequacy, but on the adequacy of God. And it is that which the world wants from us. Not to apply the management techniques of the world and the ideologies of the world to Christianity so that we build effective organisations and institutions, but in our very inadequacy to be the people of God. John Seale in his article on the modern world and evangelicals said these things and they're hard to listen to. The uncritical acceptance of modernity within evangelicalism is a serious matter for modernity does not lead first to heresy, but to idolatry. The modern world's potent rewards have come to replace our need for God. Our measures of success will be limited to the five senses, and the most religious evangelical will be little different from a practical atheist. Like the Pharisees, we will be in error, not because we do not know the scriptures, but because we do not rely on the power of God. In the period of darkness, which I've just come through, I hope, the message which God taught me was trust me. 
And I had to ask the question, Lord, what am I trusting you for in my life? I've got my salary, my house, my insurance policies. Some of us have got our health policies, we've got our pension sewn up. Everything is sewn up. Any uncertainty has got an insurance policy, a pension plan. We do it quite sincerely in the name of Christian stewardship. But what are we trusting God for in our lives? What have we got to rely on God for? James Book's classic, Knowing God, concludes by saying that we te- seem to take a take-no-risks attitude to our Christian faith, as if God is not big enough for practical problems and fears. He says this, It is these half-conscious fears, this dread of insecurity, rather than any deliberate refusal to face the cost of following Christ, which makes us hold back. We feel that the risks of out-and-out discipleship are too great for us to take. In other words, we are not persuaded of the adequacy of God to provide for the needs of those who launch out wholeheartedly onto the deep sea of unconventional living in obedience to the call of Christ. We are afraid to go all the way in accepting the authority of God because of our in secret uncertainty as to his adequacy to look after us if we do. The future of the church is in not in efficient organisations. It is not in believing that we are super Christians and that the Christian life is a romantic and sentimental, wonderful life of happiness. It is in the great struggle to be faithful to God, in the great pilgrimage to get to the end, in the race to cross the line, in the mutual encouragement we need so that we may be perplexed but not in despair. It is an emphasis in a world which is anxious but has more money than it has ever had, on the adequacy of God rather than on our adequacy and our belief. And in that, if the world is going to turn to the church again and say, see how they love one another, we have to be generous towards one another, to people who own the name of Christians in an increasingly hostile world, And rather than being suspicious of them and applying our own judgments to them by which we will one day be judged, to accept them as brothers and sisters in Christ as they do us and encourage them as they encourage us in our walk together in the light of God. Thank you. Just stay with us for another minute. On your screens coming up about now is a question. What will I have to do as a result of what I have heard? Just dwell with that for a few moments. Alex Ross from this platform about three years ago reminded us that the church is a bit like Noah's Ark, he said, a bit smelly on the inside but still safer than out. And it's in this church that God has called us to be a part of this amazing, powerful, challenging diversity. That's our challenge as we leave here. We have had a great deal to think about. 
please go and let's find ways in which we can express the life of Christ and all that he has called us to be. Thank you very much. Have a really good day, and God bless you.